I buy land where I get the best combination of soil, climate, and location. So when we plant, we'll get the best flavors possible. What I'm really looking for is flavor. It's how you grow the grapes that unleashes the potential of the location. And that's why we control all the phases of vine growth and processing. It starts with carefully choosing the rootstocks and the clones to match the land and the climate. Because we perform every step of the wine growing process, we seem to have better consistency of flavors and more complex and intense flavors. And so when anyone buys a uh, Jaylor bottle of wine, uh, they're quite assured that they're going to get the best of that particular vintage. The most important thing that I learned in the 70s was that you can't grow Cabernet and Chardonnay side by side. Tasting great wines of the world, I found that Monterey produces the most complex flavors for Chardonnay and Passerobe is the best flavors for Cabernet. We have 900 acres of vineyards in Monterey and almost 2,000 acres of vineyards in Passerobles, all fruit that comes to our own winery. Chardonnay needs a cool climate with not a great change between day and night temperatures. Each year after the vintage, we get publicly available temperature charts and look at Russian River, Carneros, and Arroyo Seco. You can see that Arroyo Seco not only has the lowest average high temperatures, it also has the least variation in temperature between night and day. Now what happens in Monterey, of course, is the wind comes up. The photosynthesis process stops in the afternoon and the wind is up, so the grapes basically just hang there. The vine is still trying to ripen them, it's not stressed, it just spends longer doing it. The longer Chardonnay takes to ripen, the greater the flavor. Because of Monterey's unique climate, we don't worry about rain in October, so we don't have to worry about rot. Thus we can let our grapes fully ripen well into October if we need to. Monterey soils offer a great complement to the climate because Chardonnay needs richer but still well-drained soil. Gravelly loam is ideal for Chardonnay. However, California soils lack potassium, which grapevines desperately need. We plant at least two crops of barley or triticale and harvest them back into the soil to create organic material or humus to increase the potassium availability to the vines. Our vineyards in Monterey also have good subsoil drainage so we can control the shoot growth. So this is topsoil. It's topsoil from right here to here. And beneath that, it's just it's like river bottom. So it's just really good country for Chardonnay. The ideal climate for Cabernet is very hot during the day and cool at night. We frequently have daytime temperatures above 100 degrees and at night it cools down to 50 degrees. Paso Robles has several microclimates. Looking at the diurnal temperatures of the three leading Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot regions in California, which are Napa, or Alexander Valley, and Paso Robles, you notice that Paso Robles has the greatest temperature change. A 50 degree change in a 24 hour period is ideal. The benefit of the diurnal temperature difference is that it aids in the synthesis of anthocyanins, which are the, uh, the fruit and color that we get from wine. Uh, there's a dramatic effect of soil quality on, on Cabernet. If the soil is too rich, the leaves are gonna be too large, the berries are gonna be too large, and so you'll just not have the flavor. What really happens here in Pastoral is because the soil is shallow and it's well-drained, grapes do well here, they develop the most intense flavors. I knew the hilltop was going to be good just from backhoeing it. Here you see, here's all the real black topsoil that we have here. And then we get into this much more gravelly, kind of reddish or, or gray or gray-brown. But uh, it looks as if this is really about our, our rooting zone in, in here. And uh, so consequently, that's where we have restrained growth. This is an 11-year-old vine up here. 
You can see where we've got not an overly vigorous vine. Fruit is all nicely exposed to the sun. The berries aren't large. Leaves aren't large. You can see where there's dappled sunlight coming on. Some of the berries are in the sun. Others, as the sun is going to come around like this, the sun will be on more of the fruit uh, later in the day. But it won't be hanging out totally exposed. Pasarobis has many soils. And so that's why over the last 16 years, I've acquired 17 different parcels, each having predominantly soils that I wanted for a particular clone rootstock climate combination. I think a winemaker truly is a tenant of the earth. I spend a lot of time in the vineyards just tasting fruit, looking at what's happening in the grapes. There's not a heck of a lot that I can do as a winemaker to make great wine out of poor starting material. Because you've got to catch those grapes at that point where the flavor is peak and the, and the pigment is ready to be extracted out of those skins. Um, you can do a lot of work all year long out in the vineyard and make a terrible decision at the very end after you've spent all this time and energy. And, uh, you know, I really hate to do that. Now, when it comes to making wine, you really, you've got one vintage. When you make those decisions on when to pick and everything, you basically have kind of sealed your fate for the season. That decision that you made to pick that day doesn't go away after that day. You can't say, well, I made a bad choice that day. That's no big deal. Well, that follows you all the way through the year. But you can't really go back and take clusters back on the vine and you know, do that sort of thing. It's, <laughs> once they're off of there, it's over. That's it. I think, in general, the basic techniques of winemaking have been pretty similar for hundreds of years. And what we're really trying to do is use modern technology to make wine traditionally, to have sort of a hands-off back to sort of the roots of traditional winemaking. What it's all about is growing those grapes properly in the environment so that when we make the decision to pick, all of the goodies are there in that grape. All of the balance and complexity of flavor is there so that when we crush that grape, pump over that tank, ferment that wine, put it in barrels, and rack it, after that whole process is done, that wine is in a perfect and complete balance. It has richness, it has suppleness, it has texture, and it goes unfined right into the bottle for that consumer to taste and understand that that wine is a true representation of whether it's Cabernet Sauvignon grown in Paso Robles or Chardonnay grown in Arroyo Seco, it delivers what that terroir, that appellation, put into that grape, and it was really not messed with by me, the winemaker. Everything I do, I want to be sustainable, not just the agriculture, but the people relationships, because those are the things that contribute to the sustainability of the flavor. Because by doing all the farming things right and all the investigation we do there, by having long-term relationships with people. That's how we learn about from year to year how to do the best job of farming and winemaking in that particular year to get these tremendous flavors.